So Jesus said, love your neighbor as yourself, right? This command is challenging, though. It's challenging enough in individual relationships, but it becomes much more complex when we think about laws that apply across multicultural states and whole countries that are philosophically diverse. So, as a Christian law student, I've grappled with this question of how to love my neighbor in the public square. In other words, what does Christian love look like in politics? Unfortunately, it has swung between the popular portrayal of conservative bigotry to the left-leaning, social justice-loving progressives, and then to the moderate rest, who are generally politically uninvolved or too jaded with politics. I sympathize with the jaded people. I historically lean towards the progressive, um, but recently have come to terms with aspects of Christian faith that compel me to think conservatively on certain social issues. And all to say, I'm still figuring it out, too. Um, for the purposes of this talk, though, I've chosen one aspect that um, relates. It's the separation of church and state. It's a topic that marked the founding of this country and continues to spark heated debate today. I'll be presenting a quick history of how the doctrine of separation of church and state began and has been applied in the U.S., to get at the second question, uh, are we going in a good direction? And it will force us to think about what an ideal balance between church and state is. And perhaps this talk will help you to consider how you, with whatever beliefs you hold, uh, would best love your neighbor in the public square, whether through voting, lobbying, organizing, or simply exercising the power of your purse as a consumer. So what is the separation of church and state, and why do we care? This question takes us back to the mid-17th century, when European settlers were still starting up colonies on the East Coast. Uh, Roger Williams uh, was a Baptist theologian and separatist from the English uh, Church of England. He was, you could say, an early advocate of tolerance as a state policy because he was persecuted by the Puritans for his beliefs and founded a Rhode Island colony that was a haven for religious dissidents. In 1644, he wrote The Bloody Tenet of Persecution, in which this phrase, separation of church and state, was is first found. Um, here is a passage from that book, and it, this book also got in, in a lot of trouble, by the way. Um, he says, so he describes the Church of the Jews under the Old Testament and the Church of the Christians in the New Testament as both being separate from the world, and I quote, and when they have opened a gap in the hedge or wall of separation between the garden of the church and the wilderness of the world, God hath ever broke down the wall itself, removed the candlestick, and made his garden a wilderness as at this day. So there he's talking about a contamination almost. I requote, if he will ever please to restore his garden and paradise again, it must of necessity be walled in peculiarly unto himself from the world, and that all that <clears throat> <clears throat> shall be saved out of the world are to be transplanted out of the wilderness and added unto his church or garden. So 145 years later, in 1789, Roger Williams' concept was written into the First Amendment as the Religion Clause. As written here, government, government shall not make law respecting a religious group or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. And these are known uh, respectively as the Establishment Clause above and the Free Exercise Clause below. <clears throat> <clears throat> so, in our view today, separation of church and state may sound like an anti-Christian refrain, but it was actually intended from the beginning as a way to preserve free exercise of religion. And the first colonists, besides Roger Williams, many of them were coming from countries with established churches. They were a mixed bag of uh, people fleeing religious persecution, um, such as the Protestants from Catholic England, or at least they had experienced the bloody conflicts there. And so in their minds, this doctrine was in, a, in an experimental way to resolve these problems and preserve religious purity. So just to hammer that in, 
Uh, we have later in 1802, um, Thomas Jefferson, this phrase is traced back to Thomas Jefferson's letter um, to the Danbury Baptist Association, um, where he says, I'm going to quote a longer passage from that letter. He says, Believing with you that religion is a matter which lies solely between man and his God, that he owes account to none other for his faith or his worship, that the legitimate powers of government reach actions only and not opinions, I contemplate, uh, basically, uh, when American people uh, made this law, they built a wall of separation between church and state. And James Madison said something similar. The practical distinction between religion and civil government is essential to the purity of both and as guaranteed by the Constitution. However, this doctrine was not really used for the first 100 years and for 150 years, and the only real time it was used in a Supreme Court case was this one um, in 1878, where the Supreme Court decided that polygamy was unconstitutional. And they basically uh, were saying, they were saying that the separation of church and state did not apply here and that they could um, rule on polygamy. So the religion clause um, did not really see light of day until the mid 20th century. And the attention it received was because of this first part, the establishment clause. And up until then, many states had laws that favored certain religious denominations. The reason that it became heavily litigated is that uh, is this landmark case, uh, which is in my abstract, the 1947 Everson v. Board of Education. And this is where the Supreme Court said that the Establishment Clause applies to the states, um, and it's not just within the purview of the federal government. In this specific case, um, a New Jersey taxpayer, Everson, challenged the constitutionality of a New Jersey law that reimbursed parents who sent their children to Catholic schools. Um, and it was basically that the state would reimburse uh, the fare for bus transportation to any of the schools, including those uh, going to religious schools. And the court in this case actually found that the law did not violate the Constitution because the services they said like busing and police and fire protection for parochial schools were so marked off from the religious function that for the state to provide them would not violate the First Amendment. <coughs> the law was more like a general program to assist parents of all religions with getting their children to school. So while it upheld the New Jersey law in that case, Everson v. Board of Education is actually said to have started this disestablishment era, which is um, in which various state laws favoring certain religious denominations were challenged and found unconstitutional. For example, we have 1962 Engel v. Vital. Um, the court decided it's unconstitutional uh, to require the recitation of school prayer, even when students could be exempt. 1968 Everson v. Arkansas, it was uncons unconstitutional in Arkansas to require um, the equal teaching um, or to criminalize the teaching of evolution in schools, receiving public funds. And so, so we go to the second question. Um, in light of these cases, are we going in a good direction? And just from my own studies, I realize it's easy to see these cases as dismantling Christianity or Christian culture. But rather than seeing these cases as battles between Christians and non-Christians, I wonder if the original writers uh, and founders would view these cases as important steps towards rebuilding an, an important wall that has been torn down. And that's one way to see the Everson case, the Engel case, and the Everson case. And in that sense, these cases haven't been attacking religion, but rather protecting its purity by keeping the garden of the church, as Roger Williams put it, appropriately separated from the wilderness of the world. I'm going to zoom through. Um, the Lemon case uh, is another similar case of disestablishment regarding uh, private <coughs> religious schools. 
where the Supreme Court laid out a more detailed test to determine constitutionality. And, and I say that um, even with this extra lemon test and more case law, it's been a very tricky balancing act. Um, and there's been more skirmishes in court um, about the First Amendment, such as requiring or having an optional Pledge of Allegiance in schools, um, allowing a cross to be on um, public grounds. The cross is found unconstitutional, but then a Ten Commandments display is okay because it's educational in American traditions. Um, and so, um, and we have relaxed zoning rules, special parking privileges for churches, tax-free status of church property, the fact that Christmas is a federal holiday, and other practices that um, have been found as valid. Um, and the reason the balance is tricky is that the religion clause also has the second portion uh, called the free exercise clause that the government can't prohibit free exercise of religion. And so the separation goes both ways. I'm just going to quickly go over um, what resulted from the second clause is, uh, well, the Religious Freedom Restoration Act. And so this is peyote. It's a cactus that's been used in Native American religious ceremonies <coughs> and gotten some people in trouble with U.S. drug law. And it sparked uh, the Religious Freedom Restoration Act um, to ensure that interests in religious freedom are protected. And this has been a, a contest between the con Congress and the Supreme Court, Congress trying to affirm the religious freedoms, and then the Supreme Court striking it down. Um, and one recent case is uh, Newland v. Sibelius, uh, where basically uh, with the Affordable Care Act and its mandate that employers provide uh, abortion contraception for their women workers, um, there's been, it's been a sticking point for um, religious employers who are not necessarily nonprofits, um, but they, by their own consciousness, do not want to provide these abortion um, services to their employees, uh, or else they would pay a fine. And so uh, various litigation groups have taken up their cause uh, against the government. In this case, the Newland family owns and operates a, uh, what's called Hercules Industries that it's a Denver-based company that makes and sells air conditioning products. They happen to be Catholic and believe abortion is contrary to their beliefs. Um, Steve Lewis is the Secretary of the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. And in this case, the judgment was favorable for the Newland family um, temporarily, and they got a temporary injunction while the judge still figured out these new legal questions that their case um, their case brought up, such as like the Religious Freedom Restoration Act applies to nonprofits, but does it apply to these religious businesses also? So uh, we get to the question, what's the ideal balance between church and state? And I've come to see that both elements of the religion clause, the Establishment Clause and the Free Exercise Clause are indispensable to achieving an ideal balance between church and state. I've also realized that church and state is not the same as faith and state. And what the founders were concerned with was the state imposition of a religion onto individuals, not that individuals would be practicing their faith in public spaces. And I want to um, <coughs> point out one scholar, Robert Wood, has called America's hands-off approach, the, quote, genius of religious sentiment in the United States, unquote. Um, he calls it a remarkable religiosity in the United States that isn't present in un other industrialized nations. <clears throat> and yeah, this model of no state-run or state-established church has been good for both the church and state, allowing a variety of religions to flourish. And as a Christian, I've also found guidance from uh, the New Testament. In this passage, Paul's first letter to Timothy, he says, First of all, then, I urge that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgivings be made for all people, for kings and all who are in high positions, that we may lead a peaceful and quiet life, godly and dignified in every way. This is good, and it is pleasing in the sight of God our Savior, 
who desires all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. And I believe that the principles in this passage can be applied in our lives in terms of thinking of our leaders and how to support them um, because we care about living in a dignified and ordered society. Ultimately, that these factors would facilitate more people realizing the truth and um, achieving and receiving salvation. So I hope this talk um, helps you consider how you can also love your neighbor in the public square. <laughs>